12 leaders congratulated Chileans for their massive participation in the constitutional plebiscite and their decision to draft a new constitution. Several European countries have decreed curfews as an extreme measure to contain the spread of the second wave of COVID-19. The Thai parliament discussed the growing youth-led anti-government demonstrations demanding the resignation of the prime minister and reforms to the monarchy. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is From the South, I'm Laura Palmeiro. Well, leaders congratulated Chileans for their massive participation in the constitutional plebiscite and their decision to draft a new constitution. With a resounding 78% of the votes, Chile's citizens approved on Sunday a plebiscite to replace the current constitution, which was written during Augusto Pinochet's military regime. The first leader to send a congratulatory message was Venezuela's president, Nicolás Maduro, who praised the Chileans for their massive mobilizations to decide the future of their country and put an end to the Pinochet's heritage. Also, Colombia's ex-senator Piedad Córdoba, Bolivia's former president Evo Morales, Argentina's ex-senator Alicia Castro, and Argentina's intellectual Atilio Borón greeted Chile for their victory in the plebiscite. And Gustavo Gatica, a 22-year-old youth suffering total blindness after being shot by a police agent, sent greetings to the Chilean people for the triumph of the approval of the constitutional referendum this Sunday. First, to send a greeting to Commander Chile Indo, the part of the 100% social trend. Keep on fighting, never leave the streets. The fight needs to go on in the streets, strengthening the popular organization, the town meetings, the assembly. We need to elate the constituents from our own ranks and generate requests. Let the people say what the constituents will say. Heavy rain triggered by a broad throw across the Western Caribbean and the outer bands from tropical storm Seta continued to pound Jamaica, flooding more roads and communities across the country. The Jamaica Meteorological Service said Seta is forecast to move away from the island across the Yucatan Peninsula and into the Gulf of Mexico over the next few days. The Met Service also forecasts that the rain will continue across Jamaica on Monday and on Tuesday a high-pressure ridge will briefly build across the island. As the rain lashed the island, Jamaica Public Service reported that the weather conditions have impacted a number of areas on the electricity network. In Barbados, the Prime Minister Mia Modley said there has to be a protocol between government, the labor movement and the private sector involving civil society and non-governmental organizations. Speaking at the Barbados Labor Party 82nd Annual Conference Rally at the San George Secondary School, Modley said considering that Barbados is working with a social partnership protocol crafted since 1991, a new one is necessary to allow for job opportunities created through national infrastructure projects to be shared among Barbadians. She affirmed that the government is prepared to walk the extra distance to take the difficult decisions, to do the complex things that would allow to take money, and instead of only giving people the opportunity to reap large dividend, to ensure that the money can be spread as far as and wide as possible in order for people to move forward. And the United States is leaving a second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. On Sunday, the country recorded 60,789 new coronavirus cases and 340 new COVID-19 deaths. Meanwhile, President Donald Trump has again falsely asserted that COVID-19 numbers are up because of the high level of testing. Many young people who heal very fast, 99% corrupt media conspiracy at all-time high, 
said Trump on Twitter. In the U.S., hospitalizations are rising, setting records in some states, and the U.S. has experienced over 8,637,000 cases of the COVID-19, leading to 225,239 deaths in total so far. This is the highest number of cases and deaths in the world. Massachusetts election officials said a fire was sitting in the Boston ballot drop box, holding more than 120 ballots in what appears to have been a deliberate attack. The FBI said it's investigating. So Massachusetts Secretary of the Commonwealth William Galvin's office said the fire that was set around 4 a.m. in a ballot drop box outside the Boston Public Library downtown. Boston police said an arson investigation is underway and released surveillance images of a person near the ballot box at all time. Officials said there were 122 ballots inside the box when it was emptied on Sunday morning and 87 of them were still legible and able to be proceeded. My immediate concern is to notify every city and town clerk in Massachusetts. I sent out an urgent directive this afternoon to secure ballot drop boxes, if at all possible, have them in, inside of municipal facilities. If necessary, as we go down the stretch in this election and they need to have police officers there, that's what they need to do. We'll deal with the compensation issues later. And Mexicans decorated the tombs of loved ones with Florida reds, roses, and bright orange salmon shoe flowers at the cemetery in Valle de Chalco in preparation for the Day of the Dead. On Day of the Dead, which takes place on the first two days of November, Mexicans set up altars with photographs of those dead and place of their favorite foods in their homes. They gather at their loved ones' graver sites to drink, sing and talk to the dead. But this year, the cemeteries will be closed to help curb the spread of COVID-19 as Mexican health authorities acknowledge the country's true death toll from the pandemic is far higher than previously thought. And we'll be right back after this a very short break, so don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. Several European countries have decreed curfews as an extreme measure to contain the spread of the second wave of COVID-19. In France, the government imposed a curfew during the first phase, and it will be implemented in 54 departments, where areas in Italy, authorities have implemented extreme measures, which include the closing of public spaces and mobilization for prioritized cases. On the other hand, Greece announced restrictions measures in Athens. In Germany, the government deployed police forces in Berlin due to the rise of protests against the restrictions. The continent has recorded over 8 million cases and over 260,000 COVID-19-related deaths. France's top scientific advisory board has warned the number of daily COVID-19 infections may be as high as 100,000, double of the official estimate. Jean-Francois, the president of the Scientific Council, told the RTL radio on Monday the virus was spreading extremely fast and that the second wave is most likely going to be bigger than the first one. Numbers published on Sunday show the steady increase in the number of patients admitted into ICUs, upwards of 1,800 in the last seven days, and the positivity rate and also rise with now 17% of all tests coming back positive. 
France has been among countries hardest hit by the pandemic, reporting 34,761 virus-related deaths. It is currently registering more than 340 confirmed positive cases per 100,000 people nationwide each week. We are in a very difficult, even critical situation. There probably are more than 50,000 new cases every day. Our estimate at the Scientific Council is closer to 100,000, twice as many between those who are tested and asymptomatic patients. We're close to that number of cases. This means the virus is spreading extremely fast. The Director General of the World Health Organization, WHO, on Monday promoted the benefits of digital transformation in healthcare, while also questioning the digital technologies needed to be used wisely. Tedros Adhanom made the remarks on the second day of the World Health Summit, which had been due to take place in Berlin, but was switched to an online event because of the pandemic. At the digital summit, about 300 experts focus on global health for three days, with the corona pandemic as the overreaching theme. Several of the leaders and health experts who spoke at the opening stressed the need to cooperate across borders and with the support of politics, science, business and civil society to get the pandemic under control. More than 42 million have been confirmed to have been infected with the COVID-19 and over 1.1 million people have died of COVID-19, according to John Hawkins University. COVID-19 is the first pandemic of the digital age. We're seeing firsthand how these new tools can support our efforts. Digital health technologies are helping to screen populations, track infection rates, and monitor resources. They're also helping us to monitor the social and environmental determinants of health, which are fundamental elements in the fight against COVID-19. And there is no doubt that digital technologies will continue to play an increasingly important role in health long into the future. This is why WHO has made harnessing the power of digital technologies a priority as part of the WHO's transformation agenda. In Poland, women's rights activists held new protests after a top court tied the predominantly Catholic nations already strict abortion law. Angry street protests have been held since the court ruling Thursday, with protesters defying a red sun ban on gatherings intended to halt a spike in new COVID-19 infections. The Constitutional Tribunal ruled it was unconstitutional to terminate a pregnancy due to federal continental defects. The ruling effectively banned almost all abortions and overturned a hard-won compromise of 1993 law that still was one of Europe's strict abortion regulations. It means abortion is now allowed only when the pregnancy threatens the woman's health or is the result of rape or incest. I'm so mad of them. I don't want to swear now as I say officially, but I agree with this vulgar slogan here. It's just that people are so mad that there's no better word. It's a literal message and I agree with it. Now I will fight for my children, that they have the right to choose, to tolerate what they want and do what they want with their body. On Sunday night, hundreds of protesters marched through the Italian city of Naples, demonstrating against a regional governor who has been calling for tighter restrictions to combat the spread of COVID-19. On Sunday, the government of Prime Minister Giuseppe Conte announced a series of new restrictions, but is keeping away from a total lockdown. The new measures came into force across Italy on Monday, forcing restaurants and bars to shut by 6 p.m., closing down gyms, theaters and cinemas. This led hundreds of people to demonstrate against the regional governor and the tighter restrictions to combat the spread of COVID-19. The demonstration was generally calm, but there was a heavy police presence after protests on Friday turned violent. Hundreds of Romanians took part on Monday at a pilgrimage to visit the relics of San Dimitri Basarov. 
People queued outside the Romanian Patriarchal Cathedral in Bucharest to visit the relics of San Dimitri Basarov, traditionally regarded by Orthodox believers as the patron of the protector of the Romanian capital. Religious authorities have used believers to avoid the mass gatherings this year to the COVID-19 pandemic, so the pilgrimage took place on much smaller scale than usual, where they all wear face masks respecting social distancing and sanitizing their hands before entering the cathedral or lighting candles. And we'll take a short break now, so stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. At a special session this Monday, the Thai parliament discussed the growing youth-led anti-government demonstration demanding the resignation of the prime minister and reforms to the monarchy. The wave of pro-democracy protests has attracted students and other protesters almost daily to the streets demanding the resignation of Prime Minister Prayud Shah. Shah. They claimed that he was unjustly reinstated in power after staging a coup d'etat in 2014 as head of the army. Among other reforms, protesters demand a constitutional amendment, pointing out the anti-democratic nature of the present constitution, written and passed under the military rule. Every single one of us here should use all our intelligence, ideas, abilities, and our hearts, including every single drop of our patriotic blood, to do something created which would benefit the country. We don't want to see clashes, not riots in the country. The government has a duty to protect the rights of every Thai citizen, culminating in 70 million people. And Vietnam is preparing to evacuate nearly 1.3 million people as it braces for the impact of a typhoon Molave. According to the disaster agency Typhoon Molave, with winds at speed of 125 km per hour and gusts of up to 150 km per hour, left the main Philippine island of Luzon earlier on Monday, with heavy rain causing seven landslides and floods in 11 areas. There were no reports of casualties, but 12 fishermen at sea failed to return to Cantanduanes province of the country. Malove, the 17th typhoon to hit the Philippines this year, is forecast to make landfall in central Vietnam on Wednesday, with wind speeds of up to 135 kilometers per hour. And China will develop the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, CPEC, further and make it as a demonstration project of the Belt and Road Initiative, said a spokesman of the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Beijing on Monday. The Orange Line, an early harvest project under the CPEC, and the Pakistan's first metro train service started its commercial operation on Sunday. The massive project is 27 kilometers long and has 26 stations, including 24 elevated stops and two underground stage situations and stations, and it provides lots of jobs for local people. During its construction, the Orange Line created 7,000 jobs for locals, and as I know, it will create about 2,000 more jobs for locals in the operation and maintenance period. The completion of the Orange Line project is another huge achievement in implementing the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. China will work together with Pakistan to accelerate the development of the CPEC and build it into a demonstration project of the high-quality development under the Belt and Road Initiative. The Armenian Defense Ministry said on Sunday that Azerbaijan troops violated the agreed ceasefire in the Nagorno-Karabakh region. According to the organization, the agreement was broken when Azeri army troops fired on positions on the self-proclaimed Republic of Nagorno-Karabakh. Meanwhile, from Azerbaijan, they denounced attacks made by Armenian artillery in the town of Safiyan. 
This is the third truce seeking a cessation of hostilities between the parties after two ceasefires have been breached since a violent escalation in the Bisaj region on September 27th. Russian President Vladimir Putin proposed to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, several measures to reduce the strategic tensions in the European continent. The Russian leader pinned responsibility on the United States for the increase of tensions after stepping out of the former short and medium-range nuclear missile ban treaty. The treaty was an important element to safeguard international security and stability, as reported by a communique issued by the Kremlin. Likewise, Moscow announced its disposal to not deploy cruise missiles on the European side on condition that the organization adopts similar steps. Protesters marched after a massacre at a school in the Anglophone southwest of Cameroon, which the government has blamed on English-speaking separatist militants. Cameroon was in shock on Sunday after a massacre at a school in the English-speaking southwest of the country, which the government has blamed on separatist militants there. Communication Minister René Emmanuel Sadi said the groups of armed secessionist terrorists had carried out a terrorist attack at that unbearable cruelty and barbarity. The government said 13 children had been wounded during the raid on the bilingual school in the town of Kumba. Seven of them seriously injured. Around 10 people on three motorbikes burst into the compound of the private Mother Francisca International Bilingual Academy, said Sadi. I lack words to express the feeling I had when I saw the corpses of these innocent children. Uh, like a father, I think I would not have remained indifferent when I saw their lifeless bodies lying in the mortuary. Even from the school itself. Oh, it was a sad situation. United we stand, divided we? United we stand, divided we? So let us be united, Kumba people, and take away Amber from our society. Yes, they are our children. We are ready to receive them back to town as good boys and girls so that we can collaborate together with them. But not this kind of activities. And with this, we have come to the end of this news brief. Remember, you can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. Remember to join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Laura Palmeiro. Thank you for watching.